हेलो हेलो यस Um hello um I want to start uh, of course thanking the organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity to present um our work here I come from uh, Germany I'm at the theory division of the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light and I will be talking about cavity optomagnetics and this is in a nutshell how um magnetic collective magnetic excitations in solid state systems a uh, couple to light so i think i think this doesn't work <laughs> um so i think uh given the name of this workshop i don't have to convince you that we are living in very exciting times in which we are going uh from um processing and um um processing information and communicating information in a in a classical way to doing it in a quantum manner so here i um chose two pictures one of the um one of the best candidates so far for um processing quantum information so superconducting uh qubits so we will and of course uh, on optical fiber so we would like to communicate information in an optical with and uh, with light why is this for is uh, for example if we want to process information here we will be doing it a microwave uh, regime this requires low temperatures but we would like to communicate the information not at low temperatures so this is best done with light so we would like to design systems that are able to um we would like to be able to prepare uh, states to process information and to communicate it and for this we need a uh, hybrid what are called hybrid systems so systems that combine different uh, degrees of freedom uh, to perform these tasks optimally so i chose here a collection uh, to show a collection of the systems that have been studied nowadays and the orcher um a common uh, a quality which is these are systems at the micro scale or at the nano scale and they use uh, collective excitations so uh, they what we want to do is to design the system so that we can use the this collective excitation so for example here is a picture of a photonic uh, cry, uh, crystal where the light and uh can couple to the vibrations in this crystal in an optimal way um this here shows uh, an unsuspended nanotube in which the electrons uh, can couple to the collective vibrations of the nanotube this is a similar uh set up here and but the vibrations couple to electromagnetic fields at the microwave level and the last picture is The last picture is a very new addition to this uh, collection of systems which is what I will be go I'm going to talk today so these optomagnetic systems in which light couples to magnetic excitations. Um so this is a uh, a picture that I will be going back later but let me go to the uh, outline or my of my talk I will be giving very briefly an introduction of magnus and the actually the mode that I will be talking about which is the kitel mode and then I will show uh that these uh, excitations have been uh, coupled uh to um microwaves and then I will be going to the coupling to light and I will show how can we could one use light to induce um to control the spin dynamics in the system so let me start then by uh telling you what a magnon is uh it's an element elementary magnetic excitation so it's already said so it's the quantum of the spin wave analogous to the phonon to the um mechanical vibrations why would we uh, would be interested in um using magnons where there are collective excitations which are robust, uh, robust 
they are tunable, for example, in frequency, and they can uh, uh, have very low power, so they are um, use, useful also in terms of energetics. So the Kittel mode, which is the mode that I will be uh, talking in the, in the next a few minutes is if you take a, a, mag a magnetically ordered material and you uh, consider that all spins are locked together, and then you ex excite, you can excite a mode in which all spins are locked together and they precess in phase. So it's like they are forming like a big uh, macro spin. So this is a homogeneous magnetic mode that doesn't depend on, on space. So we can map all these spins as a big macro spin which is processing with, with, uh, with some frequency. This frequency in, generally, in general is uh, controllable by an external magnetic field. And in the examples that you will be seeing later, you'll see that, for example, for a 30 millitesla's uh, magnetic field, this uh, frequency is in the gigahertz range. So if we want to... Uh, if we now take the spin and we want to see how this, the dynamics of the spin um, is, we can use a, a, an equation of motion, which is the landau lipschitz gilbert equation, uh, which is the equation that you see here. And what it's telling you is you have the spin that can rotate. There is uh, some external magnetic field that will make this uh, spin process around an axis, in this case, the Z axis. So this is the usual Larmor precession. But then there is a phenomenological damping term that, we can, uh, that can have to do with uh, the properties of the material that will damp the precession of the spin to its equilibrium position eventually. So these are all elements that we'll uh, need uh, for later. But uh, let me now uh, telling you a little bit about the experiments that have been performed in the last years in this kind of systems. And uh, um, now, three years ago, it was demonstrated that this uh, magnons, and in particular this Kittel mode, can uh, be coupled um, strongly to a microwave field. So the picture that you're seeing here is a microwave cavity uh, and which as a sphere of a ferromagnetic, a ferrimagnetic material is uh, put in one side of the cavity and it uh, couples to the microwave field in the cavity. This, what you're seeing there, this sphere is actually YIG, it's yttrium iron garnet, it's one of the best materials uh, for um, this kind of uh, magnetic uses. So some ferromagnetic material is insulator, so it means that the spin waves have uh, low dissipation. And it's trans transparent in the infrared, which will be good later if we want to couple these excitations with light. So as I said, in this experiment, they show that they can couple uh, strongly the magnetic excitations in this sphere that you see here to the uh, microwave field. So if you look at this plot, you see that so the microwave mode will be here, the Kittel mode will be here, and as the magnetic, external magnetic field is swept and the two enter in resonance, there is a splitting of the modes, there is a hybridization of the modes, and this splitting gives us a magnitude of, of uh, the coupling. So this is a resonant coupling. A magnon goes into a photon, a photon go, goes into a, a magnon. It's quite strong in this case. It's around 50 megahertz for this setup. And that means for the experts, the cooperativity is uh, quite high. It's around 10 to the 3. Um, yeah. So this, this is the ratio of the coupling to the dissipation in the system. So this was a performance I said uh, three years ago in uh, uh, the lab of Nakamura in Tokyo and also in Hong Tan's lab in Yale. So uh, once one year after, the group of Nakamura showed that actually they can also put a superconducting cavity in the cavity and via the microwave field in this cavity, they can couple the qubit to these magnum excitations. So this uh, provides the first strong motivation to couple uh, magnums to light or to try to couple them, uh, which is if we would be able to uh, um, couple it. So we know it couples to the microwaves, and if we would be able to couple it to light, then we could have 
uh, wavelength converter, so a um, transducer of information from the microwave regime to the terahertz regime. So this brings me to the subject, which is optomagnonics. And first of all, how light couples to magnon. This is uh, quite an uh, uh, old effect, if you want. So Faraday should, uh, already uh, a few years ago uh, made the first experiment uh, of, the, of this class in which he took uh, light for one, from an oil lamp. He polarized it by reflecting in a glass. And then what he observed is that as this polarized light was going through a material, here he put a polarizer. And if it was uh, observing it like this, there was no light. But if we would put a magnetic field now, then there would be, there would be uh, su suddenly light. So that means that the plane of polarization of the light was rotated. And what he measured is, and he did this very, very, uh, uh, with a lot of details. He tried very different materials, very different uh, ways of putting this magnetic field. He was very conscious. And what he proved is that uh, the uh, rotation is proportional to a quantity that uh, is a characteristic, as characteristic of the material, which is uh, the Faraday rotation, this theta f that you see here, and it's proportional to the length that the light goes uh, through the material. So uh, just to, uh, to give you an idea, so this is the original paper of, of Faraday. And it, this was uh, the first uh, demonstration of a direct relation between light and the magnetic and electric forces. This was around 15 years, yeah, 15 years before um, Maxwell equations. So uh, one can um, have an expression for the electromagnetic energy that takes into account um, the magnetization in the field and in the material. So actually what one sees is that this magnetization in the material uh, modifies the electric permittivity of the, mat of, of the material. And one uh, goes to an expression of the energy, classical energy that looks like this. So there is, if you see here, the, this energy is proportional to the Faraday rotation. It's also proportional to the magnetization density in the media. And, propor and it's uh, multiplying the optical spin density, which is this uh, um, cross product between uh, the electric field. So this is what is called the spin of light. And if you have circularly polarized light, this, if you take this cross product, it will give you um, the, basically the helicity direction of light. So uh, what we did was uh, taking this energy, this classical energy, and quantize it so you can see that the magnetization goes to a spin operator. The electric fields go to photon operators. And you see this is a one spin operator and two photon process. So this is what is going to allow, and you will see after that the, the, mag the magnetization dynamics, the spin dynamics is actually in the gigahertz re regime, but we have photons in the terahertz. And this uh, two photons parametric process is going to compensate by this um, energy mismatch. And now this expression, actually, if we want uh, to, start to go to a quantum model, then we run a little bit into a, pro, into a trouble if we want to uh, consider the most general way in which the spin would uh, depend locally in each position. So what we did is uh, to take this Kittel mode, as I was introducing before. So we considered the magnetization to be homogeneous in the sample, and we can replace, replace this uh, by a macro spin, which has a dynamics in the block sphere. So what we uh, realize with this is the optomagnetic Hamiltonian, which tells us the coupling between photons and uh, the uh, spin operator. So you see here I have two photon operators. I have a spin operator. And this G here is, going, is uh, giving us the coupling, which we calculated to be uh, this expression here. So you see that it's proportional to the overlap of the electric field modes functions. It's proportional to the Faraday rotation, as I said before. And 
uh, importantly, is inversely proportional to the number of spins. So that means that what is important for us is the density of magnetic excitation. So if we have one magnetic excitation in a smaller volume, it's better as to have it dispersed in a big uh, volume. So actually, the coupling between optical photons and magnons was demonstrated uh, last year, again, uh, in Nakamura's group, in Hong, uh, in Hong Tang's group in Yale, and also in Ferguson's group in Cambridge. How do they do this? So they take this uh, Yig sphere that we saw before, and they, we cup, they couple a nanofiber uh, evanescently to whispering gallery modes that are present in this sphere. So these are standard wave modes, like if you would have a linear cavity, but these are in this um, spherical symmetry. Um, and what we have to take from here also is that a cavity will actually enhance the effect because the light um, goes many turns in this cavity be before going uh, away. That means that the length of, uh, so the, the Faraday effect, it's also proportional to the length in which the light goes through and here this length is increased in, in the cavity. So what they observed in the system is that if they measure, the, they throw light in, they measure the light out, and they see sidebands in, um, in the light at the frequency of the magnum excitations. So what we did actually is to take a toy model <coughs> to see what uh, can we do, uh, if, how, to study the spin dynamics which is induced by the light and what kind of, effect, kind of effects we can expect. So we took a simple model in which we have the Kittel mode that I've uh, mentioned before, and a single optical mode which is circularly polarized in, the, in this plane here, which is the wide set plane. So that means that the spin of light that I mentioned before is pointing in the x direction. So in this uh, system, the coupling takes a very simple form, so we go from this Hamiltonian to a coupling that looks very simply. So simple, we have two photons operators here from the same mode, and the operator S and only because of the geometry we chose uh, the x direction. The, the rest of the Hamiltonian, I'm in a rotating frame, so this will give me, if I apply, if I drive the system with a laser, they give, this gives me the detuning between the laser and the resonance uh, of the cavity. And this is the term that will control the frequency of my spin by an external mag magnetic field. So in this simple example, one can calculate uh, the coupling con constant G. It takes also a very simple form, as you see here. Again, you see it goes as one over the the volume of the spin, one over the magnetic volume, proportional to the Faraday rotation. And if we go to the diffraction limit and we take a sample in which will be one micrometer cubed, this will be around one hertz. For you to have an idea, this corresponds on an optic of an optica, to an optical magnetic field density, which is quite small. It's uh, 10 picoteslas. Uh, but this is per photon per micrometer square. So this will be, for example, in a cavity enhanced by the number of photons in the cavity. So what can we do with this? <coughs> Sorry. We, um, we can calculate the, um, we can explore the dynamics of the spin given uh, the, um, um, the coupling to the light and driving it, uh, driving it externally with a laser. So, and we decided to do it uh, first um, to explore the classical dynamics of the system. So this is the classical equations of motion that one obtains from uh, this Hamiltonian. So you see that uh, we introduced also a cavity decay rate. And uh, here is the detuning. This is uh, how much, so the amplitude of the driving. And we see that the, uh, Gilbert, so the, the equation of motion for the spin, which we uh, saw before, the uh, Lipschitz-Landau-Gilbert equation, is modified by a term which couples uh, to the light. So you see here already that the light is acting as 
um, and it's an effective magnetic field. Uh, we can go uh, further with these equations in the fast cavity limit where the light uh, is much faster than the dynamics of the spin. Uh, one can integrate out this uh, photon field and uh, obtain an effective equation of motion for the spin. And now you see that really takes a, a shape which we saw before. So we have an effective magnetic field that uh, controls the spin. And interest, interesting, we, we get also a um, uh, dissipation term uh, caused by the light. So this is due to the retardation between light and uh, field and spin fields. So we uh, see the effective field here so it's proportional to the amplitude of the laser and also we can control it with the detuning. And interestingly, the damping, we also have an analytical expression. And you see here that we will be able to change the sign of the damping by controlling uh, the external laser drive. So now we can see what kind of dynamics uh, we can obtain. And so this is in this fast cavity limit. And we see that uh, in the case in which we are changing the uh, sign of the dissipation in the system, we are basically changing what is the stable equilibrium of the system. So if before the equilibrium, the stable equilibrium of the system was the North Pole, now because of the change in sign of the dissipation, we are uh, bringing it to the South Pole. So this is basically we are changing, uh, if you want, information from one to zero in some sense, yes? Also, interesting dynamics can be obtained, uh, such as uh, self-sustaining oscillations, in which by uh, a, a strong drive, one can bring the system into limit cycle behavior. I should say this kind of physics is also realizable in cold atom systems. And um, the group of Stamberg Kern in, uh, in California, they showed this kind of behavior by, um, uh, with a, so magnetic switching behavior uh, in their systems. So if one goes to the full nonlinear dynamics and not in the fast cavity, beyond the fast cavity limit that I was studying, uh, studying before, you can see that the, uh, the nonlinear dynamics is even richer. So by increasing the, the laser amplitude, we can go from this limit cycle behavior that I showed before. Then one would have a period doubling of this uh, limit, limit cycles, and we could enter uh, a zone of chaotic dynamics and even coexistence. So this shows that in principle, we can have coherent uh, uh, optical control on the spin dynamics, such as magnetic switching, uh, switching self-sustained oscillations, and chaos. And this, uh, I should mention, is a collaboration uh, with Florian Marquardt in Erlangen and Hong Tang in Yale. So let me go in the last uh, five minutes to an outlook and summary. So this is all very nice, but there is a, a problem in the current state of the art uh, in these systems, in which is the optomagnonic coupling is actually in experiments too small. So the coupling for photon is around 60 hertz. That means that the cooperativity, which if we want to do, for example, quantum state transfer should be bigger than one, in these systems is uh, 10 to the minus seven. So, um, so if we go one step back, uh, we can, um, let's go back to this Hamiltonian that I showed before, this coupling Hamiltonian. If we consider now, instead of considering the nonlinear dynamics of the spin, I consider small oscillations of, uh, of the spin around its equilibrium position, then we can uh, use Holstein, Holstein Primakov transformation to uh, put uh, this uh, spin operator in terms of bosonic operators. Then we obtain a Hamiltonian, which for those uh, uh, familiar with the subject has uh, a form which is also the form that optomechan the optomechanical Hamiltonian has, so systems in which light couples to mechanical vibrations. And uh, so now the, our coupling constant will be uh, this G times 
S square root of S over two. So it's actually uh, enhanced by a factor of square root of S. And this means, this is the fact that we are working with collective excitations and we are taking advant advantage of this uh, uh, um, magnetic ordering. And this, we can, if we can now take the uh, sample of one micrometer cubed, then we see that we get uh, a G which is around 0.1 megahertz. This should be compared to this G that I have here, so I didn't put the G naught. So this tells us that if we go to smaller samples, then we can enhance the coupling. So if you go, if you look at this figure, actually the, the spheres that are using and it's been used in the experiment right now, they are around, around uh, one uh, millimeter in diameter. So they are pretty uh, big. Uh, the other problem with these systems is that the overlap of the magnon mode with the light is actually not that good because this Kittel mode lives in the whole bulk of the system while these whispering gallery modes live in the uh, close to the surface of the sphere, right? So there is a whole, there is a lot of, of, of coupling that is lost in this uh, suboptimal overlap. So ways of overcoming this, and this is uh, something that we are working right now, uh, would be to go to smaller systems, one, uh, and also to try to design systems such to obtain better overlap of modes. So the thing is, is if one goes to smaller systems, uh, something happens, which is actually very interesting, but makes the, uh, uh, the, the problem, as usual, richer, but more complicated, and is that if one goes to the micrometer uh, regime, one starts to get uh, magnetic uh, textures in the system. So for example, this is uh, a micromagnetic simulation that shows that if we take uh, a disk and we let uh, the magnetization evolve to its um, ground state, it will form a vortex. Yeah, so this is something interesting, and this is something that we are working right now, how uh, the light field interacts uh, with this uh, kind of magnetization textures. So in this, I should mention, all, one also gets these whispering gallery modes for the optics. The other uh, interesting uh, thought and the other line that uh, one can uh, think about is to uh, improve the overlap of uh, modes take as an example the successful example of optomechanics in which they use uh, they, they design crystals such as to obtain uh, uh, optimal overlap between optical modes and uh, mechanical modes. So can we do the same with uh, optomagnonic crystals? So these are uh, two things that we are exploring right now. Uh, so I will. Uh, finish with uh, a summary. I hope um, I convince you that uh, cavity optomagnonics is a promising new field and that using collective magnetic excitations is a, um, a promising path also because they are robust, they are designable, and in principle they can also be quantum, although I didn't talk about that today. And uh, I will finish uh, with uh, advertising a little bit. Uh, I will be starting uh, my group in January at the Max Planck uh, for the Science of Light, and there are open positions for PhD and post, um, postdocs. So thank you very much. <laughs>